Hi, um, I'm Darvin, and this is the talk about the installation art gallery you guys have been seeing down on the mezzanine. Um, I have five artists today, um, Albert Huang, Randy Palumbo, uh, James Sears, Sean Montgomery, and Eric Sander. Um, and we're basically, everybody's going to give a little presentation on the installation that they have downstairs. Um, first, I'm just going to say a few words um, about art, art and technology. Um, art, just like technology, evolves over time and it's directly affected by advances in technology and thought. Um, when painting was invented, um, paint compounds developed, techniques were refined and you got more technically uh, refined paintings. Sculpture became more realistic as the tools were perfected and people learned more about perspective and form and sizing and the materials they were working with. And then we got the Industrial Revolution and art uh, joined the same logarithmic scale as technology development. You got things like photography was invented, new sculptural techniques were perfected. Um, people began using welding and wire work and a lot of things that they hadn't used for the past several hundred years. And with the advent of a critical mass of technology and the addition of now the accessibility of technology to a general user base, so many more people are taking technological elements and being creative with them. Um, and these innovative innovations in art are, they're hacking. It's hacking materials, hacking concepts, hacking ideas, hacking how something, an, an ordinary object can be taken and viewed or used in totally different ways. Um, or you can reveal new aspects of something that weren't necessarily visible to the public before, like, like clear box devices where you can see all the circuitry inside them. Um, installation interactive art is a relatively new subset of art as a whole. And its aim is to, in general, share an experience with the viewer, to cause them to think about something in a new way, um, to show them something they've never seen before, which is kind of the aim of most art. But in this case, it's drawing the user in. You interact with something. You're a part of the art instead of just an observer. Um, all the advances in small electronics and circuit, circuitry. Um, most people are now working with things like Arduino, creating their own uh, small devices using circuit boards, um, combining them with new visual display techniques using combinations of lighting devices, light interruptions, LEDs, um, neon wire, projection, and so many other different things to create just totally new configurations. And today we have organizations, things like Dorkbot, NYC Resistor, Make Magazine. NYC Resistor and Make Magazine are all both here. Um, sites like Instructables and Etsy where you can get advice on uh, home use of technology and ideas for new, uh, new projects. And they're full of people trying to network and make innovations in art and make stuff that is both useful and serves an aesthetic purpose in some way. Um, I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to introduce who's I going to have first. Uh, I'm going to have Albert Huang come up and his, uh, his art piece is a wire map and it's a combination of projection and wires. <laughs> It's on the opposite side. Hi, everybody. My name is Albert Huang. Uh, I'm the developer and designer behind the wire map. Um, let me see if I can get this up. Do you know the resolution on this? Um, yeah. We'll pick it up in a second, I think. There it is. Hey, look at that. Um, great. Uh, the wire map is a volumetric 3D render, and what that means is it takes digital imagery and it posts it into real 3D space, like the 3D space that you and I inhabit. Um, and uh, it does this uh, by using a projector and a bunch of threads. So the projector shoots its image into a load of thread, um, and it creates a volumetric image inside of that. So I'll play a little video of that. Um, 
So that is a globe floating around. Uh, it is a video, and a video is two dimensions. So basically what this video is doing, it's undoing all the work that I've done to make it 3D. But, um, so you can't really see it, but uh, there are a few people in the room that I've seen, uh, and they can certainly tell you that it's more impressive in person um, uh, than it is on video. But you can definitely get a sense of what's going on here. So those are little pieces of thread, um, and they're all vertically hanging. And a projector is standing uh, far away, um, looking at it and shooting light into it. Um, it took a lot of calibration. Um, and I have some, let's see here. This is not the same model, but this is a model of what is sort of going on. What you got up here, these are rays of light. Um, actually, this is a program that is running currently. Um, each one of these little pieces of slivers of light going in, each one of those is mapped to one string. So you have a one-to-one -one on that. Um, and that string is a randomized depth. Uh, I wanted it to be random because I didn't want any patterns to occur, because often when people see 3D, they think that they have to stand in a particular place, and a pattern would just reinforce that. So I randomized the depth. Um, and this pushed into a bunch of strings makes a 3D globe. Uh, this is the pattern. Um, this is not the exact same model, but it's the same concept. Uh, each one of these um, going up and down represents a or one of those vertical strips of light, one of these things, as it travels through space from the projector, the focal point being um, all the way down past the floor of where the projector sits. Um, and those little dots are the intersections. Uh, that's where the thread lies. So um, yeah, a lot of people ask me like where I got the inspiration to do something like this. I actually come from theater, um, and 3D composition is like a major important part of that. But one of the one of the sources I definitely have to cite is this guy named Jeff Hahn. He made the uh, multi-touch display that's touring around with Microsoft right now, um, and he. Uh, he also developed a concept called the holodust. Uh, what it is, it's a field, it's a big box with dust particles falling down. An infrared laser tracks it, and uh, anytime it hits a particle that it's supposed to light up according to a model in the computer, then a visible laser hits it and reflects. And that way you can build a 3D object with that. But um, I decided to do that with, um, with just string. Um, it's easier, it, it's simple. It just takes a projector and a bunch of thread and a lot of time. Um, and the, I actually, I came, in high school I played a lot of Counter-Strike, and then I like, took a break, I went to theater school for four years. Um, and then when I graduated from theater, I didn't want to be in theater again, so I went back to computers, and, and when I came back, a lot of uh, digital 3D technology was, I thought all that work of like, creating 3D environments and, and uh, all that stuff was being compressed back into 2D, because the only way you interact with 3D environments is uh, through TV screens or through a computer screen or whatever. And, and what I wanted to do is to create that, that visceral sense of being somewhere, being watching like a sporting event or watching, um, watching, looking at a statue. If you go to the Met and look at like a Roman statue, you're gonna have a, um, your body is gonna have a, a reaction to just looking at something that is there. So when you actually come by, um, you'll definitely get a sense of what's going on. Um, I think that's it. Uh, Definitely come on by. I'm on the second floor, uh, right next to the elevators, which I think are working now. Um, in any case, uh, go towards where all the caution tape is, because that's sort of where the elevators are. Um, yeah, are you ready for the? All right. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, make sure you go see it. It's actually really cool. It's, it's in a big tent. <laughs> Um, next up, we have Eric Sanner, and you have the, Gosh, what is yours, the, the chess? You know, I, um, I brought chess, but I want to talk about other stuff. Okay. So, it so is in store, yeah, it's still being in the process of being set up. That. And I'm going to give you a live demonstration, so it'll be very exciting. Um, so is there anything that I do to make it fit? Yeah, just. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so this is actually a talk that uh, I went to give over a year ago, and I took an external heart. And by the way, Christina already said a ton of stuff that I would have liked to have said, so I'm going to go really fast. 
and I love uh, the other work. It's awesome. So it's good to be included with you guys. Um, but anyway, this talk I was going to give like uh, over a year ago, and then I took an external hard drive, and it wouldn't boot up for some reason, so I didn't give it. So I want to recycle that presentation because I've never shared it with anybody before. So here we are today. But I'm not going to talk about everything. Um, I'm going to talk about why it's hard for me to paint for a few minutes. And I'm not really going to talk about the singularity because you guys are all singularity savvy, I'm assuming. And um, I'm going to talk about a new piece that I'm working on right now. And I'm going to set up downstairs after this talk. Um, so the way I got into painting and why it's so difficult for me to paint, I grew up uh, in the suburb of Boston, Wellesley, Massachusetts. And I read a lot of books. And then eventually, I was allowed to go to movies. And um, there were billboards and stuff. And I didn't really get to watch TV very much, but it was like around, right? And that's one of the reasons I'm weird, because my parents didn't watch TV, but anyway. Um, at the end of high school, I went to um, Europe. <laughs> and I went to Russia. And that was like a big deal, because nobody really went to Russia at that time. Um, Gorbachev was the prime minister. And I saw all these like amazing paintings. And I had like not been exposed to paintings before, because they weren't around. And um, I was like, whoa, those are amazing. And then um, I didn't know what to do after that. And then um, I, I and until then, I had never cared about painting, because it's all like, uh, you know, there were cave paintings of, of giant creatures or whatever, and then plants and then like bowls of fruit and I did not get what painting was. So it was only until um, I saw these like abstract paintings of Kandinsky that all of a sudden painting got exciting for me. Um, and there's less than a century of abstract art in our, in our history. So that's what excites me about painting is like seeing something that doesn't exist outside of painting. It's getting into the world of the canvas. And I'm Rothko is one of my huge heroes. This is a drawing that I did in the Rothko Chapel in Texas. Um, that's a Rothko painting on the right there in a the little doorway. And um, so what, what I refer to as Rothko shock is this sort of feeling that, that I'm a midget, right? <laughs> because there have been all these amazing artists. And um, it's really hard to, to think, what can you contribute to art going forward? Um, so that's sort of my view of painting, is I want to make something in this blank space, but I'm overshadowed by Rothko. Um, singularity, which I'm not going to talk about, just what Christina said. Um, oh, that was the wrong slide. It was supposed to be about art. But anyway, what she said about art. Okay, <laughs> so what she said. And then um, color study. So this is a piece, and I brought this painting yesterday to hang up, and I couldn't figure out how to hang it up without putting a nail on the wall, which you can't do because it's a convention center. So I just want to show you guys right now. So my work involves, I mean, I use, I need computer processing. I need to have things that are always changing, but I'm also really interested in the expanding palette of the painter. And I use projection, and I project onto paint, so you get combinations of colors. So if you project yellow onto another color, or in this case, what you're looking at is yellow over white, green over white, right? So I just want to show you guys really quickly. Let's see. That's probably a good size. I'm going to take one minute and just show you all these color combinations, all right? I brought some paper. greenest green that you could really have because it's green projected onto green. So this is this piece color study is a tool for me to to figure out what else to paint. Like if I want to do a still life, what color of flowers should I go by? So that's blue on blue. It's like a really blue blue, but that's orange on blue. And so they're all so I'm just gonna show you really quick every that's red. Um, and so I'm going to set that downstairs with a like looping kind of just colors on colors. And thanks a lot. And um, thank you.
Okay, next up we're going to have Randy Palumbo, and I'm sure everybody's seen the flowers at the top of the escalator on the mezzanine. I've never seen less than three people standing around those other than at like three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> What were you doing up there at three in the morning, uh, <laughs> young lady? Coding. <laughs> Where'd my adapter go? Where else can you get introduced by a beautiful young lady hacker with a vacuum tube around her neck? <laughs> plug my computer in before yeah this thing loves the uh yeah all right so i'm just gonna move you over here so just arrow through space yeah just this arrow is that the maximum brightness it must be right can i brighten it? yeah brighten it hi everybody thank you for coming it's cool to be here with all of you and the other artists especially go see albert's piece it would be easy to miss it if you don't know that back little nook of everything and it's way, way cooler in person. So my work was supposed to be at the bottom of the escalator. So I'm going to start the clock here. All right. Um, I wanted you to feel like you were bumblebees or butterflies descending upon my little unearthly garden. Who here felt like a butterfly when they came up? <laughs> bumblebees? I have a, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, at least they didn't throw it out. The last place I exhibited a couple of these pieces Bill Clinton was supposed to come and bless the show at a big charity auction, and the Secret Service covered it all up with caution tape and black plastic so he wouldn't get his picture taken with my product. <laughs> um, so I've been a long time fan of 2600 and different hacker things. Um, I've never taken an electronics class or anything, but I've always taken stuff apart and had lots of parts left over. I used to go on bulletin boards in the olden days, and go on all the M MIT um, websites and make my own mangled versions of their projects. They used to make a lot of very complicated electronic things. There's one that's made out of Viagra and fingernails and little solar panels. When it charges and fires off, the Viagra tablets spin around and the fingernail propeller spins. Um, lots of people asked to have that taken away from where they were when they saw it. Um, <laughs> here's some pieces from the the car antenna years. I used to make a lot of stuff out of those electric car antennas. Who remembers radio? <laughs> Who has a ham license? KBSDZ, right? A K2S something. I'm, I'm, I have one too. I used to have a packet radio station in the way olden days um, in lower Manhattan. Um, uh, so these are all things with actuators that they, they go on and off depending who's going by. Um, You'll notice some more of the, the phallic imagery. Those are castings actually out of condoms. Here's a hot rod that I built. Who here builds hot rods? No hot rod builders, all right. You, who made their own computer? All right. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never built a hot rod either. Um, so I've always, as I was thinking about why, why am I a hacker? Because I'm kind of not, but I like, that there was a period where I tried to write code and I've done things with microcontrollers and stuff, but I, I love making things do things they're not supposed to do, which in the art world, there's a, a history of that, Marcel Duchamp, and then in the 80s, 90s, other people. But I, like, I kind of like the way the hacker community does it better. Um, when things are taken out of context and made to do something way better than what they were supposed to do, and it just makes the world a, a richer place. And I think it makes, it makes some of us fit in better, too. It made, always made me feel better when 2600 comes or I log on to some crazy um, website that some kid made in his basement. Um, I hacked some mosquitoes for several years up in Joshua Tree National Park. Um, I hacked a dog from the pound this, this weekend. He's going back. He <laughs> ate my mom. And um, so I'm not afraid to interact with nature. I also build, um, if anyone, are any of you technology, um, well, millionaires, billionaires, first millionaires. Now billionaires, all right, well, when you're ready, when you want a really cool off-the-grid summer house made out of trash and old shipping containers with composting toilets, um, call me. That's my summer house. It burned up, which you can see in the corner, but it's actually still just as good as it ever was, except for some 900-year-old pinion pine trees being gone. And my neighbors laugh at me, but I have hot water, I have electricity, 
and uh, none of them lost their home, but I still have more services than them. That's in, uh, <laughs> that's outside of Joshua Tree where my kind of main studio is because it's a really fun place to work and there's quite a lot of weirdos and outlaws there that are doing interesting things because it's so inexpensive to live. If you want a home with, if you don't need glass in the windows or plumbing, you can still get a house in Joshua Tree on your credit card and have much of the limit left over. So this is Buttercup, which is up at the, the top of the stairs. This is in Joshua Tree, um, outside a little gallery called Art Queen that, that I have. Um, so I first put that out there, and everyone loved it. See the kids going crazy. I think they're underage drinking kids, but we'll skip over that. Um, and then very quickly, the Reverend Joey, I think Joey Josephs and his wife, from Jesus' House of Prayer, who had the misfortune to rent space from me in the same complex, <laughs> called the Highway Patrol and had Buttercup covered up. Can you believe that? In my own place. Um, there's his car. But, but they covered it up with a translucent tarp and they kind of made this kind of interactive performance piece that was even better. Um, <laughs> and then I kicked their ass out of there and then it, now it's back to its original beauty. Um, and it's always there. If you're ever in downtown Joshua Tree, you'll see that glowing softly by the highway. <laughs> and then as kind of a, a redemption, I bolted Buttercup on the back of this old 1940s bus that I'm fixing up to run on. I have a little biodiesel gas station that's also, it's off the grid, so when I get in trouble, I just move it a little bit. It has a, <laughs> a solar panel and a car battery, and it moves, it gets around. <laughs> You have to, it's called Turkey Town Biodiesel. If you need to refill in the neighborhood, there's a, I'll tell you the combination. It's all in the honor system, and we, we sold, I think, like several thousand gallons of fuel in the last couple of years. So then I decided to take it to Burning Man, where it would be more appreciated. I had never been there, and people always said to go there. Um, sorry, clock check. Um, and, uh, so it was a big hit there, and even the police in Nevada wisely realized they should just pull me over and take pictures and say how cool it was. <laughs> <laughs> how many people go to Burning Man from here? Anybody? All right. I was thinking I've only been once, and I'm going again, and I'm doing a huge installation this time. I think it needs more hackers. There's, are there any hippies in the room today? One, two hippies. All right. I love hippies, but there's a lot of hippies there. There were like 40,000 hippies there and 10,000. And, and it, it is a little expensive to get in, but if you do an art project of some significance, they'll give you some passes. Uh, so I, I'd love to see people from this community making stuff and bringing it out there. We need Wi-Fi. We need digital communications. It's there's a lot of... What? It's too close to DEFCON. That's just too much Nevada. <laughs> All right, all right. Maybe I'll try to get them to move it, but I'm, in, I'm a nobody there. <laughs> That's the scenery is quite excellent there, and a lot of people were, were naked. I gave away all my old sun-bleached dildos, and people made the coolest things out of them. This one guy made a, a bunny ears out of it and wore them for the whole time. So here's the end. Look, this is Burning Man with a double rainbow. There's the bus, some, some more of my work. I made stuff out of rubber chickens for quite a while. These are my ponies, which, out of respect for Chris, Christine, I, I did not bring. Um, they have motorized oscillating dildos on them, and they actually kind of gallop up and down. <laughs> now, <laughs> they've been um, covered up in several states. Um, and that, that vibrator company is my corporate sponsor now. They send me boxes and boxes of stuff. <laughs> if you come to my studio, there's always party favors and take-homes. So this is the video, this is called Wallflower. There's a, a version of it called Payflower outside that you have to put quarters in to make the liquid crystal obfuscation go away. How many people put a quarter in Payflower? Anyone? With the, oh, only the millionaires. Right, it's not, you get a whole minute for a quarter. I think it's a pretty good deal. This is a little dirty video that I made, but it, it has this floral motif. I'm interested in the food chain and pollination and <laughs> dissemination um, and scalar symmetry, which I partly learned about from reading computer stuff, when things are very similar on a small scale to the structure of things that are very large. So here's Payflower. Doesn't that look enigmatic? Don't you want to go put a quarter in it? Here's a sketch from my piece at Burning Man. It's what was going to be in a shipping container with all these 
solar flowers around it, because all, all of these works were solar, the flower things. Then I found this cool military trailer that the base in 29 Palms didn't need anymore. I polished it. Isn't that sharp? And then these are the hundreds of hand-cast glass nipples with thousands of LEDs. And then these, these little collars were made by a defense contractor. It's, it's a little slow out there right now. These are the, uh, the anal bead ceiling fixtures that I'm working on. Um, and then here's a little, a little Photoshop of what it's going to look like just on the outside. Doesn't that make you want to see the inside? It's going to be a grotto of, of my creations and then this scary video of, it's called the Grotto of Manifest Destiny, that the American Dream is the theme this year at Burning Man. So please come and thanks everybody for being here. Thanks very much. Remember, go see the flowers. Yeah, you've already seen the flowers. Who doesn't see, who hasn't seen the flowers? <laughs> Okay, next up I have James Sears, and downstairs on the right side of the, the main floor, he has the, uh, the spinning LED sculptures. All right, thanks, Christina. Um, so I'm James Sears, and I'm here with my father, Ron Sears, who's uh, sitting back by the sound booth there. Raise a hand. Um, and we are uh, presenting our pair of uh, current LED persistence of vision three-dimensional displays. The whole, the whole process started with sort of this image. Um, we're really inspired by the idea of the globe and sort of the significance of this image. I think you know, I've heard people suggest that, that this image actually started the, the environmental movement as we know it today. It was the, the idea of sort of having this perspective that we were just on this ball floating around in space is, is what kind of allowed us to, to start to see the, the fragility of everything. And I, you know, I'm certainly not the first person to, <laughs> to have this realization. Um, they're, again, standing on the shoulders of giants. This is a, a sketch from Buckminster Fuller done in 1962 of uh, what he called the geoscope, which he envisioned as a 200-foot diameter sphere covered with over a million lights. At that time, it would have been light bulbs uh, to be suspended in the East River uh, in, front, in view of the United Nations to, uh, to try to display information, data, to help these world leaders make better decisions. And I think you know, we can all see that that's pretty important. So we decided to, to start small. This is, uh, this is our first. Our first iteration, it's a 12-inch diameter, 64 LED display. Um, we didn't want to use a million lights. It's a lot of soldering, so we decided to use persistence of vision instead. So we can take this uh, plexiglass ring, spin it, turns into a nice sphere. If you put lights on the sphere, then you end up with a glowing sphere. If you blink the lights, you get pixels. With pixels, you can make patterns, and with patterns, you can make images. And so here's a a video of this first one in action. Maybe. And so this is this is totally inspired by, you know, the, the people that have come before, the you know, the Make magazine people and you know Lamore and the bicycle displays and everything that that have done POV in, in uh, two dimensions and just sort of spin it on a different axis to make to make a three dimensional display. And um, so, so that was a big success for us, and we were really happy with how things turned out. But it's, it's only 64 pixels high, and it's only eight colors. So it's, it's, it's a far cry from, from this. It's a far cry from sort of being able to actually show real information. So, so we're, we're constantly trying to scale up to, to get a higher resolution and more color depth. So what we've got downstairs is actually our, our, latest, our latest iteration, which is still not quite quite finished, actually. It's sort of, um, this is our second show with it, and it's, it's definitely a work in progress. But we've stepped up, instead of microcontrollers, now we're using uh, FPGAs, uh, 16, or, uh, 216 LEDs high, about uh, 500 colors right now. So we're getting, we're getting a lot closer to, um, to this, but we're, we're still, uh, it's still definitely a work in progress. Um, but you can come see where it's at right now downstairs. Um, in between those two pieces, though, we 
we realize that we're doing the surface of a sphere, which is great, but there's still, there's a lot of volume within that sphere that we, that we, weren't, we, we weren't able to visualize. And uh, that, you know, our perception of depth is, is a really interesting thing to play with, as, you know, Escher uh, brilliantly, brilliantly showed. So we realized that by spinning on two axes at once instead of one, we could actually fill the entire volume of a sphere with uh, a relatively small number of LEDs. This is an early 3D rendering of, of Ultra Orb, which is also downstairs. You can see the, uh, the cross is actually, that's models of uh, surface mount tricolor LEDs. This whole apparatus spins on, on a horizontal axis and then simultaneously spins on a vertical axis so that we start out with a disk and rotate a disk on a second axis and actually end up with a sphere. Um, it's a lot, of, a lot of physics involved in this that we sort of learned as we went along. Um, you know, it, it turns out that the, the force of precession doesn't like, doesn't like you to be uh, spinning things on both axes at once. Um, you know, I'm sure you've all seen sort of the gyroscope demonstrations or try to hold a spinning bike wheel and turn it at once. This is that kind of thing except at 1,000 RPM and 300 RPM. Our first prototype actually just exploded. <laughs> so as it turns out, we had to, uh, we had to go back to the drawing board and um, we have two, actually two identical, two identical boards, two identical mounts and motors counter-rotating in opposite directions. It's actually a technique that um, searching through, searching through uh, Google found a, uh, a helicopter actually. Helicopters often often operate this way, so that that led to a lot more mechanical complexity. This really is more uh, more a mechanical project than than an electronic one at this point, really. But still, a fair amount of electronics on board. We've got you know 16 pick microcontrollers, 320 tricolor LEDs, and a uh, bunch of flash memory. That when we spin, we get flat rings, discs, things like that, and we spin on the second axis, and we get three dimensional patterns. Um, so, you know, what's next? We, we uh, you know, the volumetric displays are great, but I think in a lot of ways it's, it's a uh, kind of a, it's, it's a very difficult way to go about that problem. I think, you know, in some ways Albert's got the, the volumetric thing in a, in a more practical way, but we really, the surface displays are kind of where we're focused right now, and we really, we want to we want to carry through the vision to to scale up, not just in terms of resolution and color depth, but in physical scale, and actually try to bring Fuller's Fuller's vision to to a reality, to to actually have something like this in, in larger than human scale that people can come and be influenced by and and see see the happenings of the world in in front of them in in true three dimensional nature and. Um, you know, to, to visualize something rotating like that at 200 feet in diameter is, is certainly, seems maybe a little crazy, and, uh, it, but I think, you know, there are people that, a lot greater than myself, that realized that, you know, the first step to doing anything is, is imagining it. So, we uh, are happy to be here, happy to be inspired by all of you, and, uh, you know, hope we share inspiration back. So, thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, next up, we have Sean Montgomery, and you might have seen his uh, art at the other side of the top of the stairs. Uh, oh, you need the video. Is there any chance we could dim these spotlights by like half? If not, that's fine. Things will just show up better. All right. All right, um, so my name is Sean Montgomery, and I'm currently finishing up my PhD in neuroscience, and, uh, but I'm looking to get on the, the fast track out of science. Um, I'm looking for an escape pod, so I'm thinking about how to combine art, science, and technology and sort of create a future out of that. So if anybody has any ideas, I'm, I'm wide open. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about um, some uh, apparel that measures your body's responsive, responsiveness. You know, most of the time, uh, our bodies are changing 
Uh, in fact, all the time our bodies are changing. Electrical impulses are traveling up and down our bodies, and yet everything around us is kind of dead. Our clothes are dead, our stuff, uh, our, our objects are dead. So there's a disconnect between our fashion and design and, and us as individuals. So I want to try to bring some of that dynamicism of our bodies and use that to, uh, on our clothing and in our possessions to express um, ourselves and to create new opportunities for communication. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is, I don't know if you guys can see it with the lights, is something I've affectionately entitled um, my, my heart on. Um, so what, what this is doing is this is actually um, measuring my EKG and displaying it as pulses of light. So every time my heart beats, uh, my, my shirt is beating with it. And it's, it's a lot of fun wearing it around because you realize um, how much your heartbeat is changing during social interactions um, and how often we ignore that as our heart sort of meters away our life. And it also gives you a sense of, of the electricity um, running through us that, that keeps us alive. Um, and I think there are uh, a lot of future directions for this type of thing. Um, I think building it into shirts more. Right now, of course, I'm measuring it from these, these pads. Um, and uh, using off-the-shelf wireless technology to be able to project it, or to be able to send the signal to hats or shoes or whatever you want. Um, and I think most importantly, to, to, to get into networking with these sorts of things. Imagine if a bunch of people were wearing these in local area networks and you, know, you could trade heartbeats with somebody. You could have multiple people's heartbeats. You could create collective heartbeats um, in, in large groups. Or you could map them on Google Maps. You could do all sorts of interesting things, I think, with networking your biological signals. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is something I've affectionately called uh, my truth. And um, so what this is doing, this is measuring my galvanic skin response, which is a common measure of emotional responsiveness used in lie detector tests and other things. Um, so I may be kind of maxed out right now, but let me see if I smack myself really hard. Um, yeah, I'm kind, of, I'm, I'm kind of reaching the limit here, um, giving a talk. But um, <laughs> so, um, so I actually brought a video of my brother um, to to display what it does. Let's see if we can hear it. Here we go. How did Dr. Vegan make it in public? I think several Whoa. times. We lost it. Several times, All right. All right. <laughs> well, that won't work. All right. Um, well, so I have an installation downstairs um, that where you can come and you can measure your heartbeat, and you guys can come try on the Truth wristband um, and see. I mean, it, it really responds well. Um, uh, it's it's kind of amazing when you're not, um, you know, giving a talk. Uh, you can. <laughs> I think I'm also surrounded by electrical noise, which which uh, uh, may be an issue also. Um, so there's a lot of sort of future directions for this sort of thing. Actually, but, sorry, I missed one thing. Um, so I just wanted to say you know, how much fun it is to wear it out. So I, I've worn it out a lot. And um, you, know, it's, you go out to a party, and people want to try it on. And they pass it around, and they try to you know, figure out how they can get a rise out of each other. Um, I actually had, I was at a bar the other night, and this girl came up to me and like, grabbed my package. Um, <laughs> which was kind of exciting. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, um, and I have a friend who's here, uh, studies Tai Chi, and he can actually light it up on command. Um, and and I, I've learned actually a lot about my friends from them wearing it. Like I've learned some of my friends are really sensitive to other people. Some people, you know, it's particular types of things that they're sensitive about. So it's a lot of fun and it really exposes, you know, you as an individual and allows you to communicate in new ways. Um, so the future directions on this, um, I'm, you know, basically I think it would be cool to take this to the next level. It's not like these ideas are really all that radically new. I mean, these biofeedback's been around since the 50s and 60s. Um, but 
where is this stuff? You know, mood rings suck. They don't do anything. Um, so, you know, I think it's great. I think people, you know, I think there would be, it, it may divide people. I think some people would be like, uh, I can't handle the truth. But I think a lot of people would like to, you know, be involved. So if anybody out there, electrical engineers, marketers, I don't know, whatever. Um, so there's lots of other cool possibilities, too, with networking. Um, for example, there's, there's uh, a web page I just became aware of online. Uh, he handed, this, this guy or girl, I don't even know, um, handed out these devices, um, something similar to this that measures your gal galvanic skin response with uh, your G uh, GPS. And then you can map galvanic skin responses so you can see at this busy traffic crossing, you saw, there was a, spatially a peak in the galvanic skin response, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I think there's lots of other possibilities. You could have, um, you know, this interface is very easily over the internet. Uh, you could have your, your text color changing as you, as, you, as you get excited about this or that. Um, you can communicate with your robot pets. Um, I, I, I really think the sky is the limit here. Um, so uh, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, what I've called my thinking cap. Is it on? Yeah, it's on Excellent. Um, and so this is stemming out of my background in neuroscience. Um, and basically what it's doing is it's measuring the electrical potentials generated by coalitions of neurons in my brain and then projecting that onto RGB light arrays. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of information there, and I'm just parsing it in a very simple way. Um, but to give you some sense of scale, there are about 100 billion neurons inside each of your head. Um, and that's way more sta stars than you can see on a clear night sky, not even in New York, like in Montana. Um, and these neurons have complicated ways of interacting, and so beginning to understand that and use that to communicate, you know, in person over networks, um, using them to control your mouse and things like that, um, I think has a lot of possibility. So um, that's pretty much all I had to talk about. Oh yeah, this was a, a little display of basically. So that's these are brain waves here on the top. That's the raw signal, and then you can do spectral analysis, analysis, which is what I'm doing here, and that's the color signal here. And this what this is what happens if you close your eyes, open your eyes, things like that. Um, so those are the different signals I'm measuring and projecting here. And I just wanted to give thanks to some of my friends. My friend Stefan uh, helped me a lot through this project, uh, these, this process. And uh, uh, check out my website. Send me an email. I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Come see me at the, my installation. Uh, you can check out your heartbeat. Um, so thanks a lot. Thanks very much. We have about 10 minutes available for questions. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question, microphone is over on that side. Hello. Ah, these Hi, are please. scary. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to make, a, I guess, a quick comment and thank you guys uh, a lot for your inspiration and what you're really showcasing here. Um, I've been studying a lot of sociology and, and art and technology in one of my classes uh, lately. and. It's really interesting to see how the more we get back to realizing that technology is a subset of art and seeing how those implications affect the rest of us and seeing how that affects innovation. And I just wanted to thank you guys for being so inspiring. Uh, anyone else? No? Um, all right, I guess we'll, oh, you wanna say something? Um, we have, we have about 10 minutes if you want to, yeah, I guess. I have one minute? Yeah, go ahead. Question. Oh, question? Yes. Um, I think it was for Randy. Um, how did you, of course, start the toy thing? Like, where did that come from? <laughs> the, the toy thing? The sex toys, like oh, where do you, how do you get involved in that? I mean, oh, it, I don't know if that's a question you want to answer, but. I think I, partly in the service of, of uh, kind of reversing things, I was, I think I first started making things out of, um, out of condoms, which um, in the 80s condoms were all, all over because well, first people were just carrying on and throwing condoms everywhere and then when the AIDS crisis began, they became another kind of powerful, potent image 
so I started making all these female utter like things that I mostly didn't show that, that both of those that one motorized piece with the aerials had had them on it um, and then that eventually turned into these flower forms and then it just became really obvious I was going down 7th Avenue one day and I walked into the pleasure chest or somewhere and I was oh wow pistols and stamens and anthers and they're only like if you buy a double ended 18 inch one you can get two for $12 <laughs> now, now I'm a wholesaler. <laughs> I have a question to Andy. Um, so, where did you exhibit your work besides this conference? I actually, for just a few more days, I have some work up at Morgan Lehman Gallery on it's 29th or 30th Street on 10th Avenue, uh, right on 10th Avenue, and you can see most of it in the window. Um, I exhibited in California quite a bit at different col college shows. I think my biggest thing ever will be this monumental installation at Burning Man this summer. Um, and then I have stuff typically on the web and you know here, here and there. New York, seems like New York isn't my hot spot, but I'm working on that. You can see my work at, at Palumbo.com, my last name, P-O-L-U-M-B-O, if you want to see what's going on. I have a little blog of current things and then a wild flash site of older things that one of my friends made that's amazing. Thank you. Okay, and um, is there any reference of your um, uh, dildo work? Uh, because, I'm, I'm sorry, I just didn't check out the title. <laughs> so, uh, is there any reference of that to the conference? Or you just uh, decided to show up? Like, or you were just invited to show up here? <laughs> well, they left the door open and I got in, actually. <laughs> okay. You mean specifically that? I mean, I didn't create those specifically for hope. I've been doing those kind of things, well, things in that family for years and the dildo work for a, specifically for a couple of years. And it's what I picked to show here because I thought, well, this is it's kind of like a garden. All of the young minds blossoming Never amid the technology, it's a fertile atmosphere. Okay. Thanks. Uh, hi, I have two quick questions. Um, sorry if I'm fuzzy on the names, I was kind of late here. For the, uh, the one who was showing off the spinning uh, images in the sphere, I was curious, have you ever tried to put uh, moving, well, it seems like the globe was kind of moving, have you ever tried doing like video or moving pictures on that, and have you done any experimentation with that? Uh, yeah, actually, the, um, the, the one that's down there right now, mm -hmm. um, we're, we're working on some synchronization issues, but sort of in the, mm -hmm. in the shop at home, I've, uh, I have done some animation work on it, and it's, um, yeah, it's, the, the goal is to be totally capable of, of you know, full frame mm -hmm. animation video, and uh, so that's, yeah. it's a really important thing for, um, you know, for, for, for doing data visualization and sort of to be able to do video. Um, the, uh, the first phase will be sort of pre-recorded video mm -hmm. and eventually, you know, live, plug in a HDMI cable and do, you know, like a, ultimately like a three-dimensional TV. Cool, and my second uh, quick question is to the awesome biofeedback guy. I, uh, <laughs> it was really interesting. Everyone here was very interesting. Uh, it impressed me, so I thought you guys did a really great job. Uh, I was interested that I've heard a lot of interesting thing about biofeedbacks, and I'm kind of curious, do you think one day that in the same way they have like a weather report and an allergy report that there might be some sort of like mood report of like different parts of the city? <laughs> like, you know, today New York City is happy today, or <laughs> stuff like that. Because I've heard interest and I'm curious. Yeah, no, I, I, I think... Okay. I think I think we're going to start using these signals a lot more for a lot of different things, and I, mm -hmm. and I think the collective behaviors that, that are going to emerge out of that is, is one of the most interesting parts. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, both in, in terms of utility, for like something you're suggesting with, um, you know, a, a weather report for our moods, um, but also I think in terms of um, art and, and bringing art mm -hmm. into new forms in your house. So mm -hmm. you could have interactive biofeedback art on your wall that communicates with your friends Mm -hmm. art on his wall or her cool. wall or your family or larger networks that do collective behavior. Um, so I think there's a lot of possibilities for that sort of thing. Um, and we'll see, we'll, you know, I think we'll start to get a sense for what's going to be really useful and what's, what's going to be for, for fun um, as, as we start to use these things more and, and wear them on our bodies so that we get a sense for what they really mean and, and how they react.
It's okay. I just wanted to say I really like all you guys' art, and I'm thankful that you came to Hope because you added a lot to the floor. So good job. Thank Thanks, you. Man. All right. Um, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, quick question for uh, Randy. If, have you ever heard of a company called Obibod? They make vibrators that interface with iPods. They have servos that move according to the beats. I'd love to see what kind of multimedia kind of project you could do with something like that. I've, I've heard of teledildonics where they have kind of interactive right, yeah. appliances yeah. you can use long distance with friends and, and enemies over the net or the telephone. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, I didn't know they had a portable Yeah, they actually have like cool. RCA headphone jacks. So you can actually plug it into a guitar and you can actually play the guitar and it makes it move in accordance. And what, could you say the name again? Yes, yeah, O-M-I-B-O-D, O-H-M-I-B-O-D. Cool, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. We'll all meet there later. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks to my five artists. Thank you guys for going to see the art. Um, if you haven't gone and seen it, everything is on the mezzanine level. Um, just look around for a label that says Last Hope Art Installation Gallery, and you'll be able to find everything. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.